don't know me. Um, Loud, louder? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. It's turned off, Ray. You got to turn the microphone oh, on. Okay. Well, here you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, for, for you that don't know me, I'm Ray Seiler. Uh, my mother calls me Raymond, though, uh, especially when she's mad at me. Anyway, um, <clears throat> tonight we have a, a speaker that we've had uh, s several times before, and you've always enjoyed him, and he's always willing to give us a speech. So. Um, Anyway, he's a graduate of Eastern Kentucky uh, University. This is just for you know your information as far as uh, identifying with the speaker. Uh, anyway, uh, he has a master's in chemistry from Xavier University, and uh, he's a certified health physicist. Now, we didn't have very many uh, certified health physicists here at Mount. We had a lot of people in the health physics department, but as far as a certified health physicist you were one of two is that correct uh, when i came here it was andy phil jenkins and me okay so three okay john keel john keel yeah but he was gone by the time i got here yeah i know he didn't make room for you yeah <laughs> what a great guy anyway Right. Anyway, so uh, our speaker tonight is going to talk about the Mound Dosimetry Program. Please welcome Doug Draper. Doug. Thank you, Thank you, so much, Ray. you know, when, when I was first asked to do this uh, talk, and, and they asked me if I could do a talk on Mound Dosimetry Program, I thought, well, you know, what's there to talk about? I said, yeah, I can probably put something together, make it take a half an hour or so. So then I started going back through some of my old notes and some of my old records and things of that nature and more I read. Here's, I was just telling Jack, here's what would happen. I'd get out an article and I'd be reading for something and I'd get interested in the article and then I'd keep reading and I'd keep reading and then I'd forget what I was looking for in the first place. After a couple of weeks, I went back and I looked and I thought, well, if I cut this out and I cut this out and I cut, I might be able to get down to an hour. <laughs> That's where I am right now. I'm hoping to get this done in an hour because there's a lot of stuff to talk about when we talk about the Mount Dosimetry Program. Now, understand, I started here in 81 and I, I left in 2005. So that's 24 years. You know what? That's not even half of the mound of how long mound was around. So there's just a whole lot of what went on in the Dosimetry Program that I'm I'm taking, I'm taking it on faith. The things that some of the things I've read, and there's some things that I'm really not going to be all that sure about, but certainly I'm going to give you my best shot at the Mound Dosimetry program. So let's see. Um, Ray, would you like to either you do that, or maybe I can almost. I'm I'm dangerous with one of these things. Okay, well, yeah. try it. Okay, watch out. Yeah, it's, well, I think it's got to be maximized first. Oh, how about that? Let's see. It's just brief history. I can't go backwards. Does that mean it's going to be down? Okay. There you go. Was that you or me? That was you. Hey, hey, let me try that again. How about that? It does work. Of course, now I missed my first slide. Okay, so let's talk about what is a dosimetry program. You know, normally when we think about dosimetry, we think about the badge that we wear. Well, we think about the badge that we wear, you know, and that's a dosimeter. Um, maybe a pocket dosimeter or something like that. And that's what a dosimetry program is. Well, actually, if you look, oh, I guess I need to aim at that. If you look at dosimeter, I just decided to on a lark, look and see what dosimetry was in the uh, in a uh, dictionary so I could get an idea of what it was I was supposed to talk about tonight. It says, the accurate measurement of doses, especially of radiation. That made sense. Then it says, the measurement by a dosimeter of the dosage of radiation a person might have received. So 
that goes back to what we saw on that first slide. Most people associate a dosimeter program with wearing a dosimeter. Then it also says C drugs, C measurement, and C radiation. I'm not exactly sure what I need to look about drugs for, but <laughs> hey, so be it. Now, I guess the question is, who cares what dosimetry is and who really needs it? Well, let's talk about what dosimetry really is. Do a dosimetry program really, really doesn't capture what all is going on. I think a better term would be a, a dose management program. A dosimetry program is a, really a dose management program, part of a comprehensive list of activities and tasks where the dosimetry from the dosimetry uh, program confirms that the, that the processes and controls that you had in place while you were doing, doing the work were effective. Now that's what I think of, uh, of uh, as, a, uh, dosim as a dosimetry program. And I think of the dose management program as being a subset of the site safety program. I mean, surely that's what I think we did. Now before I can really talk about what we did here at Mount, I'm glad to give you, okay, half of you should probably plan on taking about a five minute nap. The other half of you who are historians might find this interesting. Okay, 1895, Rankin discovers x-rays. A few weeks later, everybody's got x-ray devices. They're out there doing medical stuff with them and they're looking at each other's hands and I don't know what all they might have been looking at, but in any event, there were, within a few weeks, there's a couple of cases reported of physicians using x-rays in medical arts. One of them was to remove a shotgun, shotgun pellet from a guy's hand. Well, there were two cases reported. One of them was successful. I didn't hear what the unsuccessful one was. Okay, and then in uh, 1896, Henri Becquerel discovers radioactivity and tells Pierre Curie he ought to investigate it, which he did not do. He gave it instead to his wife to work on. Uh, physicians uh, in 1896 noticed no dermatitis on the hands of a researcher of x-rays and recognized that x-rays can harm healthy tissue. In 1896, there's a couple of independent reports of eye irritation from x-rays. 1902, they proved that uh, x-rays can kill higher life forms. You know what the higher life form was? A gerbil. <laughs> And now who wants to x-ray their gerbil? Uh, let me tell you, that's, of course, you've got to understand that was over 100 years ago, so. Um, in 1922, um, because there were no, regula no regulatory agencies, there were no recommendations, the x-ray, the American Registry of X-ray Technicians got, uh, got together and formed a committee, and they decided to start kind of like coming up with some guidelines for themselves to protect themselves because there wasn't anything else out there. And as part of that process, uh, this guy named Dr. Failer recommended that radiation workers carry dental film and process it every two weeks, which was the first proposed use of the dosimeter. Interestingly, there wasn't anything to say how, how much is okay or how much is it okay. He just says, wear it and if it gets too black, you probably ought to cut back on your x-rays. <laughs> Um, and then uh, in 1925, uh, based on radium, um, this much sheller or whatever his name is, proposed a tolerance level of about 0.2 R per day. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, I wonder how far it went. Oh, I went the right number. Okay, so in 1929, okay, so we've been in the business now for 35 years, and we construct the first portable survey for monitoring x-rays, Laurie Taylor. Then, um, we, uh, this, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name, suggests a limit of 0.1 R per day to the whole body and 5 R per day to the fingers, which is the first uh, uh, introduction of the concept of permissible, higher permissible bodies for limited body parts. Um, and then 36 to 40, uh, after the cyclotron was invented, patients were uh, administered I-131 at Massachusetts General Hospital, and they're looking at 
what kind of good things I-131 can do, rat work at MIT on radium. Interestingly, the rats were more resistant to radium than people. Who would have thought? Well, in 1939, um, we came up, or the concept of criticality was, was proposed, and the potential energy, and they realized this could be a real weapon. Um, in 1941, maximum permissible body uh, burden uh, was set at 0.1 microcurie for radium. And they were, by this time, uh, uh, working with some other radionuclides from some of the, uh, and the, from some of the radionuclides, and they find that radiostrontium behaves like calcium in the bones. And uh, they're doing some more work uh, at University of Rochester on uh, rats. I guess rats are a little bit closer to people than mice are, I don't know. But uh, in December, 40, December 6, 1941, not a day that will live in infamy, but that was the first large-scale atomic project started, which later evolved into the Manhattan Project. Um, I guess that was fortunate timing that that got started the day that it did. Um, enormous uh, strides in immediately took off, um, mostly to support the Manhattan Engineering District in, as far as instrumentation and things of that nature. And uh, in 1942, it was determined that uh, there were, well, in 1940, 41, and early in 42, they, just, they realized that U-235 could be potentially used to construct a bomb, and there was a different isotope that, would, that had an even odd, even atomic number, odd neutron number, and that looks like a fissile material, plutonium-239, and they could make it, so they said, oh, well, Maybe we ought to go with both ways. So the U.S. having un, unbounded resources decided to make both uranium-235 weapons and plutonium-239 weapons. <laughs> Later they discovered that they were going to need polonium-210 before either of them would work. That's how Mount got its start. Okay, but there wasn't much known about plutonium or polonium, and so based on the radium data and the chemical nature, uh, they were able to predict the biological hazards, um, and the chem and the work on the <laughs> Manhattan Engineering Project was primarily done by the chemical companies because chemical companies had a long history of working with hazardous materials very successfully. Um, and if you look at <laughs> even like the Mound facility, if you look at the way Mound facility was designed in 1948. It was actually pretty remarkable how how well this place was designed. It wasn't until we started trying to take it apart in 1955 that we started losing a lot of the controls that wound up causing problems later. Um, but in 1944, Herb Parker, who was out at uh, Hanford, calculated the first MPC for plutonium-239 at uh, 3.1 times 10 minus 11 <laughs> microcuries per cc, and now we. I think we use a uh, MPC for plutonium-239 of 3 times 10 to the minus 12. So he was really pretty close, <laughs> just basing it on the, uh, the radium data and the, um, and the uh, chemical nature of plutonium. He also proposed the concept of the REM, and he and Arthur Compton gave me a title that I could later work to achieve, and that's a health physicist, which I thought was very considerate of. <clears throat> so, in the Manhattan Engineering District, uh, as, uh, the recommendation was that less than one microcurie of polonium-210 be ingested, and that was later revised to a total body burden should be less than 2.25 microcuries. That's kind of what we were basing our early work on in plutonium at, uh, at Mound and at the Unit 3 and at Unit 4 running meet. Okay, so here was Here's an extract, and folks, I, have no, I don't remember which of the documents I got this out of, but these were some uh, general health and safety rules for the Dayton Project in 1944. Establish standards of safe levels for, uh, of exposure for all types of radiation, detect radiation under a wide variety of environmental conditions, and interpret data from routine and special lab surveys, 
develop means of personnel protection from radiation hazards, and indoctrinate or train personnel in HP procedures. So you can see as part, that radiation had been pretty well integrated into the safety program uh, in 1944, before we really got into the production process. Here were some of the uh, controls that were in place in uh, June 44. And I think these came from maybe MD 10032. I don't know. I don't, think, I don't even know if I have a copy of that. I don't know that. Well, anyway, here's what I came up with. Big game exposure limits were 0.5R per week. Uh, and I think they used a pencil dosimeter in 1944. Um, urine was 3,000 dpm per 24 hour sample, and I have seen numbers of 5,000 and 3,000 both. I also saw some spot urine sample numbers that were a little bit, that were on, based on a 50 milliliter sample. Air samples had to be less than 2,400 uh, dpm per cubic meter. And then we had, uh, uh, contamination surveys where they would take wipes and if the wipes were less than one and a half thousand dpm per hundred square centimeters and that was okay and if it was less than ten thousand it was uh, caution if it was more than ten thousand needed to be decondered you need to be wear, wearing PPE and then they would post the uh, the uh, doors to the labs with color-coded panels above the doorknob um, Special clothing, smocks, shoe covers, and all, and then uh, there were eating and smoking restrictions, and people were on bioassay that were working with the uh, polonium. Hmm. Okay. Um, mound in the early days, now that was 44, so here's what that had, had evolved into by 1951. Um, so, now you can see they're not, they're, they are lower than the 44, for example, the beta gamma exposure went from 0.5 R per week to uh, 0.3 R per week, et cetera. Okay, um, now, the dosimetry system, which if you think of it more as a dose management system, actually consists of a number of different uh, pieces that kind of fit together as a, as, as a type of a puzzle. And, and so if you look, at, in the early days of Mound, there was a technical group. Well, there were technical issues that needed to be uh, addressed that included such things as sampling, analysis, and measurement. There was management issues, uh, organization, priorities, you know, who gets more money to do what. And then there were administrative issues, uh, like what personnel were going to do that, what, and what, where they were going to get the funding, et cetera. So there were, there were a number of different high level um, organizational type of issues that needed to be, that the dosimetry program was an integral part of in each of those cases. Okay, so 1948, Mound gets going and they're already putting out polonium's uh, neutron sources, et cetera, and they do great things. And then, then a couple years later, they wind up with uh, the actinium program and et cetera, et cetera. Well, 1955, they decide to close Mound down. Well, and as they're downsizing down to about 250, I think, or 250 people, 260 people in 1955, the health physics section was reclassified as an HP group, which was less of a section, uh, and moved under the production division. The electronic services section uh, was closed, and they used to do all the counting in the counting rooms, and so that wound up uh, going to health physics. B, R, and GP were decontaminated. You know, I, for some reason, the, the, whole, the whole time I was here at Mountain, I didn't realize that GP had actually been a contaminated facility. But, yes, because it was decon in 1955. Later I found a couple of uh, projects that had been in GP and I was surprised. Um, and um, they set up monitoring procedures and urinalysis for the ionium refinery work and plutonium neutron fabrication work. 
So there was some work that was going on even though Mound was closing down. Um, who would have thought? Okay. Um, in April 1955, the uh, polonium urinalysis lab was moved from I-102 to the cold site of T-Building and set up in room T320 and uh, the 24-hour urinalysis lab was relocated from I-104 to room 323. So that shows you how they were trying to uh, minimize the footprint and they were uh, moving out of some buildings. Uh, they were still pretty heavily in R building and T building and E building and some work was going on in, in like the warehouse and maintenance building and things of that nature. But certainly um, some buildings were being uh, were being uh, abandoned. Okay, so let's talk about the dosimetry program as we're going through these rather rather remarkable changes. And interestingly, when I came back from uh, serving my time down at Fernald, you know, the first thing I was asked to do by CH2M Hill when I came back as RADCOM manager, my boss, uh, Cheryl Cappell, says, Doug, here's what I need you to do. Here are all the people in your group. She says, I want you to give me their proposed layoff date. And put your name on there, give me your proposed layoff date too. <laughs> you know, that's kind of what we were going through here in 1955 as well. You know, how do you, and, and you know, I was thinking to myself, okay, if I let this person go, who's going to do their job? And when this person goes, I'm going to have to cross-train somebody else to do what they're doing. Who, who can that be? You know, so it was. A, it was. Um, it took a lot of thought to try to come up with with how to let people go. Um, well, let's talk about the dosimetry program and some of some of the and be thinking about how how you go through all these changes and what happens to a major program like this. Well, first of all. When we do uh, external dosimetry, we wear do dosimeters. But you know what? Not everybody has to wear a dosimeter. I mean, we kind of think of that, but if you have a group of people that are going into an area together, sometimes they're going to, you'll do what's called ganging. And you might put five, six, or seven people together in a group, and only one or maybe two of them will have a dosimeter. Then when they come out, all the people that went in there get assigned the same dose that comes off that dosimeter when they come out. And that's okay as long as the people that are wearing the dosimeters are at least at the front. And if there's somebody that's going to get a dose, it ought better be one of the guys that's wearing a dosimeter. So another uh, aspect of the dosimetry program is stay time calculations. So let's say that our allowable dose for today is 100 millirem. And uh, we're going to go into to an area that's got a dose rate of 25 millirem an hour. Okay, so we can stay four hours. That's called a stay time calculation. And that was often done to say to limit the number of people and where they were going to be and what they were going to be doing. And that particularly was the case in the SM building back in those days, not so much in R and T. And then uh, we also had to be concerned about a number of different kinds of radiation, gamma, x-ray, neutron, beta, and we were measuring all those with our badges. So uh, the external dose program was really a pretty, there was a lot that went on just in external dosimetry. Now when you throw in the internal dosimetry portion where you're looking at the different routes of intake and each radionuclide and its chemical form has a different retention time, which means it has a different dose factor, and then try to calculate the doses, but the doses are regularly changing because they're coming out with new models and new algorithms for calculating those. I mean, and you're saying, okay, now let's see. The polonium model has been changed, so that means we need to go back and change our arithmetic process, and while you're changing that, the plutonium calculation model is changing to a different type and so and then you're not only that but you also have your bio or your chemistry that's being updated on it gets to be real messy so as you're trying to reduce the number of people and combine your programs 
you've got to be thinking. You've got all these things that are up in the air in a state of flux, and you're trying to manage people and programs. It's very difficult. I'm not exactly sure who the health physics manager was at the time. I think it might have been Dave Scott. I'm not sure. But whoever it was, I'm glad it was Evan, not me. <laughs> By the time I came along, heck, all I had to do was say, well, we're going to take people off. It was Warren. No, it was John Bradley. John, yes, it was John Bradley. You're right. Yes, it was John Bradley. See, by the time I came along, all I had to do was go out and hire some contractors. Well, let's see. So here are some workplace indicators that tell us that we have a dose issue or a dose problem or don't have. Contamination surveys, air sampling results, uh, if we have spills or visual signals like we see uh, liquids uh, running down a uh, uh, drain line or something, those are, would be workplace indicators that tell us that maybe we got a problem that we need to maybe look at. And so those workplace indicators had to be part of our dosimetry program. If we see, if we see that uh, the air samples are high in this room, that needs to be reported to somebody so that somebody else can order some special bioassay samples. And then the lab has to be aware that these samples are coming in, but they're not going to be our routine samples that we normally get that might be a one month sample or a one quarter sample or something of that nature. So there's a lot of coordination that's going on. And then, the, and then the dosimetry people have to be made aware, hey, you're going to be getting these bioassay data, and that's because we saw these kinds of issues out in the workplace. And so we're going to have to calculate some special doses. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of the dosimetry program is based on what we see actually in the work that's being done out in the, uh, out in the field. And we'll see. Oh, how about that? So, Nowadays, we would look and we would say, if you want to look at a more or less a, a comprehensive dosimetry program, these are all the elements that you would actually look at. So let's see, nose wipes, whole body counter records, calculations, film bench, TLDSR, self-reading dosimeters, criticality badges, gamma TLDs, neutron TLDs, beta TLDs, blood samples, urine, fecal, breath samples, stay time, air samples, nose wipes, workplace indicators, biokinetic models, transfer coefficients, risk tolerance values, QAQC training reports, permit system, procedures, and site policy. And if you can put all that into one program, you'll have a good dosimetry program. This had to evolve here at Mound, you know, even though we knew back a couple of weeks after uh, x-rays were invented that x-rays caused harm, it took a long while to put together a system that actually could address all of these different things going on at the same time. Okay, so let's look at some of the radionuclide programs that we had here at Mount. Well, 1943 was polonium-210, our, our first foray into the nuclear world. 1951, we had the activated radium, or the irradiated radium program to make actinium-227, which even though it's a beta emitter, it, decay, it beta decays to thorium-227, which is an alpha emitter that has a much longer half-life. Well, the actinium has a much longer half-life. So, polonium with a 138.5-day uh, half-life, you'd make it, you'd put it out there in your product, and uh, six months later, you were making more. And six months later, you were making more, and that got pretty expensive. A lot of reactor time. The actinium-227 had a 21, 21.3 21 year, 22 year half-life, and so you could make one of them and heck, put it out there and just let it stay for a while. Um, that didn't really pan out very well. Uh, and then in 1952, we had uh, the thorium redrumming project. 1956, the ionium project, which is thorium-230. And they were going to irradiate thorium-230, I think, to make protectinium-231. And I'm not exactly sure why. I've never figured out. It was part of some program, reader reactor program, I think, but I don't know. And then uh, 1956, we had PU-239 come in here. We were making neutron sources with the PU-239, primarily. Uh, and then 57, we had the tritium program, 58, the uranium-233 program, 
And in 1959, uh, plutonium 238 came in, and that was the one that really kind of um, became our new polonium 210 as far as making initiators. Okay. Um, let's see. Maybe this will work. Maybe not. I think this thing's running out of juice. Oh, of course. All right. So. And here were some early mound controls for the various isotopes that we were using here. And I'm not exactly sure how those numbers got goofed up in those, co in those columns, but oh well. Okay, so polonium-210 was 10 counts a minute in a 50 milliliter urine, spot urine sample. Unless you, were, unless you uh, exceeded that, then you'd have to do a 24 hour urine sample. That's where that 3,000 counts per minute came from. Plutonium-239, uh, three and a half counts a minute in a 24-hour sample. Um, Protactinium-231, 2.2 counts per minute in a 24-hour sample. Well, you can see there were different, there were different counts that corresponded to, at that time, 300 MR in a week, which is what our uh, guidelines were for, uh, for uh, dose limits. course. Okay, so here were some of the groups that did some of the different activities. The counting was done by the production division, sampling was done by the operations division, workplace monitoring was done by the health physics section, uh, instrument maintenance was done by the electronic section, and dosimetry was done by the monitoring group. So that's just some of the different folks, each with competing uh, priorities and um, administration and things of that nature that were uh, involved in uh, the dosimetry program here around. Ah, there we are. <coughs> yes. Okay. What a great picture of an early mound film badge. Mm. I, you know, it looked so much better on the screen than it does up there. But anyway, that's what the that's what the mound film badge looked like that we wore from 1948 to 68. Um, okay, so in 1946, the external dosimetry program, monitoring for whole body uh, for penetrating radiation. They used dental x-ray film. The, the dental x-ray film had a threshold of about 40 millirem. Here's what that means. Let's say you were on a weekly film badge. And let's say you got nothing. You know what? You didn't know you got nothing. What you knew you got was less than 40. If you got 45, you'd say, oh, well, you got 45. You either got 45 or you got nothing. There was no 30 because you couldn't measure it with that, with that uh, old film, uh, with that dental x-ray film. Um, in 1949, they started using uh, neutron film badges. And film badges were, or film was used at Mound from 1946 to 1977. 1972, we came up with an extremity, well, actually we had an extremity monitoring program before 1972, I don't, um, but it was not, uh, let me just say, it wasn't, it wasn't universally applied throughout Mount. It was much more formalized in 1972. Um, 1977, Mound went to TLDs, thermoluminescent dosimeters, and in 1991, uh, the DOLAP certified dosimeter with track etch it was introduced to Mount. So we, the external dosimetry program really kind of evolved over the whole time that Mound was operational. Okay, 1946, for people that worked in the actual polonium production areas, they would wear a film badge and two pocket dosimeters. And the film badge exchange schedule, quarterly, monthly, bi-weekly, weekly, or daily, or special, was based on whatever activities you were doing and what your expected dose was. Um, in 1967, there was a proposal to badge all site personnel. 
And that was, and in fact, when I came to work here in 1981, Wanda Webb came and got me at the uh, front front uh, door there, and she was wearing a TLD. So I thought, oh, Wanda, so you're a radiation worker. Tell me what you do here. She says, well, I work for Herb Meyer. I'm the secretary. I says, well, okay, I saw you wearing a TLD. She says, well, everybody wears TLDs. And I, that was, this was the first place I'd ever seen that everybody wore TLDs. I was highly impressed. But now that is a place where you can badge secretaries and heck. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about neutron dosimetry. So in 1949, we were using Kodak NTA film, but the way NTA film works is <coughs> neutrons go into the film and they leave little tracks, tracks that are too small to see. But the number of tracks is proportional to the neutron um, dose, so you've got to count the tracks and how far the tracks go. So uh, in 1956, they bought a lights, uh, projection microscope, which helped that a whole lot better than using the uh, magnifying glass and a flashlight. Uh, then in 1964, they bought a xenon lamp source, by the way, uh, that, uh, that the light's projection, uh, oh, no, that, that one lasted pretty well. Uh, then they, bought, uh, they brought, bought another microscope in between there that didn't do very well. It only lasted a couple months. Then uh, there was, in uh, uh, 1967, they went to an American optical microscope, and then 1977, they went to TLDs, and then in 1991, as part of the DOLAP dosimeter, they went to track edge. So, so there were a number of different types of dosimeters that we used for <coughs> neutron monitoring. Well, here's what some of the issues are with that. When you're using film, you're looking at neutron how far neutrons go into a photographic film and then you develop the film. For a TLD, what's, what you do is you use <coughs> lithium-6. Lithium-6 captures a neutron, gives off an alpha, and then you're reading alpha uh, damage in the TLD. And so you process it like a regular TLD. But that TLD also picks up gamma, so you're getting gamma and neutron, you have to use another TLD to get gamma only, then you subtract that gamma from the neutron, and then you got your neutron. So I mean, it's a little bit more complicated process. Then the track etch is a, uh, is a CR39 plastic, and it gives you nice big <coughs> tracks where the neutrons go in and how far they go and how big the, the tracks are, that are is uh, proportional to the energy of the neutron, and now you can come up with energy spectra and all kinds of good stuff, but the problem is if you're looking straight on, you get one set of tracks. If you got it off to the side, eh, not so good. So so the CR39 still has problems and there is no perfect neutron dosimeter out there. Okay, but that is what our, pers our uh, film badge dosimeter looked like, neutron uh, film badge dosimeter. In, uh, the, in, the, in 1949. Oh, there it is. Okay. So let's talk about some of the issues with the external dosimetry program. Well, first of all, you got mm -hmm. issuance and collection. Who gets a dosimeter and where do I give them their dosimeter? Somebody's got to know that. Somebody's got to know, for example, that Ray works in R1. 32 or wherever you were, she didn't work 132, I'm sure, but wherever you worked, somebody had to know that Ray Seiler gets a badge once a month and it gets delivered here or wherever it gets delivered. And they need to know that, for example, like Cat gets a badge once a month and it goes to E105 or wherever Cat's working. So different people had to, somebody had to know who was getting dosimeters and they had to get the dosimeters back. I mean, if you if you lose a dosimeter, what dose do you assign somebody? I mean, that's kind of a big issue. So you got to get dosimeters out. You got to get dosimeters back. Um, standardizing. How do you calibrate a dosimeter? Well, pretty easy on the gamma. You start getting into neutron dosimeters, and you got all these issues with uh, with directional. Uh, 
uh, aspects and things of that nature, it gets pretty tough to, uh, to uh, standardize or calibrate. And then you get into such things as when you're doing film, if the temperature of your, of your uh, bath is a couple of degrees warm or a couple of degrees cool, you're going to get errors thrown into your uh, dose calculation. So the, pro the chemical processing and all like that, background control. You remember everybody used to take their badge home. And some people had radium watches and they'd throw their badge up next to their radium watch. And then they'd come in, they'd have a high dose, and they were never in an area. It's like, how is that possible? Well, you know, so background became very important as far as being able to subtract off the right background to be able to calculate the right dose from a, from a uh, film badge. And then records. I mean, keeping records, everything. Now, of course, we are all erudite computer savvy people today, but there are a few of us that remember actually having to hand write data on, on log books of hundreds and sometimes thousands of dosimetry records. And somebody had to do something with all that. And they had taken take them off those and then add them up and subtract them, divide them, and multiply them, whatever they did. So the, so the records and the processing was really pretty uh, complex as well. Well, tedious, if nothing else. And let's see. I think, oh, look, I did it again. Okay, so, and when we talk about, those were film badge issues. When we talk about TLD issues, as far as organization administration, you had the same issues you had with the film badge. But in addition, you have instrumentation, validation of media, fading, and heat response issues with TLDs that you didn't have with the badge or with the film. So some TLDs, as it turns out, if you get them irradiated, within a, a couple of weeks, they start fading. And so if you wait a month to process some types of TLDs, as it turns <coughs> out, you're winding up losing a good portion of their dose. So you got to you got to process them much faster. Others are have a longer residence time or uh, less fade, but they're not as sensitive. So you got all these trade-offs that you need to make with when you're using TLDs. Not the least of which is if you throw your TLD up on the dashboard of your car, and it gets above 105 degrees, and then it just kind of wipes it out when you don't have anything. So then people come in and say, "Well, my gosh, I got worked in a hot area for." The whole month, he got no dose. He must not have been doing anything. Yeah, so, okay, external dosimetry considerations. Here are some other things that we need to consider when we're doing external dosimetry. There are, I mean, we think about trying to get the dose off of our whole body, but we also have to be concerned with the skin dose, lens of the eye dose, um, deep dose, and non uniform dose, so that if you're working with your hands, um, TLDs, as it turns out, especially neutron TLDs, you can't really use on a, in a uh, ring badge, not very well, because <coughs> you're looking for albedo uh, neutrons, which you don't get off your hands. So you got non-uniform dose issues. Then you got criticality monitoring issues as well, and neutron beta dose issues that all need to be considered. Here's what, uh, what we have in a, in a perfect dosimeter. Uh, folks, there's no such thing. That means that all of us worked at Mao all those years, and we thought we were getting perfect data. <clears throat> well, it wasn't exactly perfect, but I mean, you know, you got to take what you can. You got to take what you can get. I mean, you do the best you can with what you got, and that's that's what Mao did. Someday, long after we're all gone, I'm sure somebody will come up with a perfect dosimeter long after we're all gone. Um, so, let's, uh, let's do kind of an overview here. Radiation exposure can occur from direct expo uh, exposure from a source, and we typically measure that with the dosimeter, but it also can occur from incorporation of radioactive material into the body. And there, we typically uh, measure the exposure through bioassay. Fortunately, we got some folks here that are experts in bioassay, and I'm sure they will bail me out a number of times in the next few slides. <laughs> and we'll need to, if I can ever get the projector to go forward. There we are. Okay, 
So here is what you have to do if you're going to if you're going to assign somebody a dose based on internal exposure. First of all, you got to know what the radionuclide is. Develop a biokinetic model considering the chemical and physical parameters and the incorporation mode: ingestion, inhalation, absorption, and injection. You got to determine what organs are going to be affected. Calculate the dose and effect, and use a an appropriate algorithm to do the calculations. That's kind of what the internal dosimetry process is. Okay, bioassay. Okay, so bioassay is the determination of the amount of radionuclide in a body or specific uh, location, organ, or whatever through either direct measurement or indirect uh, analysis of bodily materials or samples. I think all of us that have peed in a, in a container over the weekend know what the process is. And I, think, I think most of us have done that at one time or another. Um, you know, it was interesting. My kids never asked what was in that box. I don't think they wanted to know. Okay. So here are some other kinds of bioassay samples besides your analysis. We also have fecal sampling, nasal swabs, blood samples, air analysis, biopsy, breath sampling and analysis, and in vivo measurements. So when we talk about bioassay, there is a whole range of things that we can look at, that we can prod, pull, push, or otherwise snag to be able to get an idea of what you've been exposed to internally. Okay, um, one of the big issues with internal, internally deposited radionuclides, we don't have this problem with plutonium-238, and that's background, naturally occurring um, radionuclides. But when you're dealing with uranium, like they had down at Fernald, that is a huge issue because if you live on a farm and you're drinking well water, you're going to have a whole lot more uranium in your body than somebody that's drinking Dayton, I don't know, what river does Dayton draw its water out of? Well, whatever. You know, they don't have much uranium in that water. So, so it's very difficult to assign a background to an individual for uranium. So you, you're, you expect that if you apply the, a dosimeter, a bioassay program uniformly at a uranium facility, everybody's doses are going to be a little bit higher just because you can't subtract out natural background. And some of those natural backgrounds are pretty doggone high. Okay, then also the internal dosimetry consideration. I mean, you don't have, you don't have to worry so much about workplace indicators when you're talking about an external dosimetry. You just take the thing and read it and you say that's what the person got. You talk about internal dosimetry, well, now workplace indicators become very important. Um, the isotope mixture, if often we'll see not so much at Mound, but at other places like, uh, well, we'll take Sprue, for example, up in New York. They had a number of radionuclides, fission products, and they says, well, you know what, we cannot measure zirconium-93. Well, that's okay, it's pretty tough to measure. But it's easy to measure cesium-137, and we know that if we produce this much cesium, we get that much zirconium. So we'll measure the cesium and just figure you got that much zirconium corresponding to your cesium. And that's good until it gets out in the environment and the zirconium floats away and the cesium stays bound to this one kind, kind of soil. I mean, or the cesium floats away and the zirconium's there and you, and you measure it and say, ah, no cesium. So there's no dose and yet here you are getting dose from the zirconium. So mixture homogeneity is, is very important in uh, dosimetry considerations unless you can analyze each, by isotope each of the potential bad actors there. And then you've got parent progeny relationships so that, I mean, at Mount we use that to great advantage. When we hit, when we were doing the uh, irradiated radium program, we were actually taking radium samples and analyzing them and doing long counts on so we could count the radium-226, the radium-224, and the radium, 
I don't know, was it 223? 223. 223, yeah. So, so we, were, we were, by looking at the different uh, half-lives, we could determine each of them, and from them, determine the, uh, the uh, parent that, they, that gave rise to them. Okay, then we have the lamb capability. I mean, this is all we've been talking about is sampling. Now we've got to talk about the lamb. Somebody's going to process your, your specimen, your nose wipe, your blood sample. What Some of us, I guess, could leave a hair sample easier than others. But somebody's got to analyze that. And the question is, how good is that lab? Well, fortunately, here at Mount, we had a pretty good lab, and we knew what they were doing. They were honest with us. You send a sample off-site, they let somebody else analyze it, you may or may, you may, or may not be surprised by, by the results that come back. So sample size, MDA, the, uh, the critical level, all have an important bearing on what the lab's capability is to provide some measure. And whatever that measure is, is going to go back through those complicated algorithms to give you a dose. Let's see. I think it will eventually go. You know what? I, th I think it doesn't like me to stay on a, uh, any given slide very long. Right here. Ah, excellent. Okay, so bioassay sampling is based on the effective half-life and the determination of potential <coughs> in this dose. So let's talk about effective half-life. Okay, one of the isotopes we dealt with at now pretty routinely, I guess everybody remembers, is tritium. Tritium has a 12.3 year half-life, which means half of it will be gone in 12.3 years. So you go into this room that's got airborne tritium all over and you, it smells like tritium, maybe I ought to leave. <laughs> you walk out, you've got all this tritium inside your body. Now we're going to take a urine sample. But you know what? Tritium leaves the body very quickly because it follows body water. Wherever your body water goes, so goes the tritium. Well, we know where most body water goes, and so, do, so does the tritium. So tritium only has an effective half-life of 10 days, even though it's got a physical half-life of 12 years. So if you, if you, but plutonium on the other hand, 87 year half-life, and depending on the kind of plutonium, it might have a, res, a half time residence in your body of 100 years. So it's gonna stay around for a long time. And if I get my plutonium bioassay sample today, that's why if I get it next week or next month, you know what, it's not going to be much different. Not the case with tritium. You wait a couple months with tritium, it might be all gone, and then you wind up missing your dose. So you've got to have a frequency, a sample frequency, that corresponds to the effective half-life of whatever the isotope is you're looking at. Otherwise, you might uh, have a uh, missed dose. So that determines your sample for sampling frequency. But here's a problem you wind up with. If you sample too often, then what winds up happening is your error on each measurement gets too large because you have a uh, smaller interval between your uh, samples. So, you know, for plutonium, it was very difficult. We wanted to have the, the lowest detection limit and that meant we had to space our samples out a certain amount of time. Generally speaking, if you were sampling people for plutonium quarterly, that was good. If they were in a higher risk area, you might want to sample them monthly. But monthly, quarterly, good. But you wouldn't want to sample people for plutonium weekly because your errors get too high. Um, now, the kind of bio, when we talk about a bioassay program, normally we talk about having a baseline, which is when you come to work, pee in the bottle. I think, well, I haven't even started working, I'm already peeing in the bottle, this might be a problem. But the reason why is they want to know what your background is for the radionuclides that you're going to be dealing with. Then, you get put on a routine uh, schedule based on where you're assigned, and then you pee in the bottle every so often or whatever. And if anything, workplace indicators indicate you may wind up having a special uh, bioassay sample. And then when you get ready to walk out the door, they say, take this with you and make sure you bring it back when it's full, or 24 hours later, whichever comes first. Oh, I keep doing that. Okay. So. 
The identification of the radionuclides is, is very important so that we analyze for the right thing. Here's what you find out. If you were in a thorium area, but the lab thinks you were in a plutonium area, they take your sample and they analyze it for plutonium and they don't find anything and you get no dose. Well, the fact of the matter was you weren't in a plutonium area, no wonder you didn't get any dose. You were in a thorium area and they had to analyze the sample for thorium, not, not plutonium. So the exact knowing what radionuclide you were exposed to is very important. And then the chemical form. If you have a, a soluble form of plutonium, it's going to come into your, in, and you get exposed to it internally, it's going to quickly clear the lungs and go to other organs like the bones. But if it's a very insoluble form of plutonium, you'll breathe it in and it'll stay in your lungs. If it stays in your lungs, you find it pretty easily on the lung counter, on the whole body counter, on the vivo counter. But if it's a, a soluble form, you're going to have a better chance of finding it in a urine sample that's collected within a few weeks after the exposure. So, and if you inhale it, you're going to have a different biokinetic model than if you see some plutonium <coughs> over on a table or something, you go over and decide to lick it up. I mean, that's going to give you a very different dose. Um, and so the, uh, the assessment of bioassay results is going to depend on all of those factors and then you plug them into whatever algorithm you're using and confirm what the bioassay is telling you with the workplace indicators and then consider retention, translocation, ex excretion of specific radionuclides. Well, let's see. So, and here's what I mean by that. You remember I was telling you back when we had the uh, irradiated radium program, one of the ways that they could also analyze very quickly what your body burden was on these different, different uh, radionuclides was to have you blow into a balloon. Not just any balloon, a weather balloon. So you could sit there and breathe into a balloon all day and eventually fill this, this balloon up and then they would take it and analyze it for uh, radium 220, uh, or radon 222, radon 220, and radon 219, which would then go back to the activity of the radium 226, etc. Okay, so uh, dose calculations, you have to use approved codes. That, folks, I know a little bit about internal dosimetry. I know enough to know that if somebody gave me a stack of bioassay data and says, what's this guy's dose? I would say, let me go hire a dosimetrist because I am not the specialist that can give you that answer. I can tell you whether the guy needs to be kicked in the butt or not, but don't ask me to calculate his dose. We need specialists to do those dose calculations. And there are a number of different techniques you can use. There's a Bayesian approach. There's all kinds of different um, methods that you can use. And if somebody got a high plutonium dose and we use chelation therapy to clear it out of their system quicker, that messes up all the metabolic models and there's no prediction predicting how that's going to turn out. So all of these factors need to go in there. Then somebody's going to do a dose calculation and you should never trust that person's evaluation. You always give it to somebody else and tell them like, hey, you're doing this dose calculation. You don't tell the first guy who you gave the second dose or gave it to to confirm what they did, but they'll do a, a similar dose calculation. If they both come up with the same answer, yeah, you feel better about it, but maybe not exact. You may have to give it to a third person. But in any event, always make sure that any dose calculations that are done are independently verified by a person who's not related to the first person uh, to do the uh, independent uh, review. And then you have a third level of review, which is usually somebody who's knowledgeable of what the person was doing and what you would expect to see. And if, and if what you see is what you expect to see, then you uh -huh. with it. If it's not, then you uh, get somebody else to maybe review again what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got to re report the results. So here are some early mound bioassay programs. So 1945, pol polonium 210 urinalysis. Um, interestingly, in 1989, 
a New York University study showed that the urinalysis recovery um, that we had estimated at Mound was low. We had estimated that it was based, it was approximately 90% um, on the copper discs that we did the urinalysis uh, plating on. But the New York University study indicated that the results could be as low as 10%. So now the question is, okay, for all these bio polonium bioassay analyses that we did all these years, if we assume 90%, but that number may not be correct, it may be as low as 10%, that means we have to go back and now recalculate all those doses, applying this new, this new retention, or this new recovery factor. Um, and then in 1971, the polonium 210 work was done now, but that shows you we worked with it from 45 to 71. In 1989, they do some more work at a university, and now we have to go back and redo the uh, doses. That's all part and parcel of it. So even though a dose is calculated, it's not set in stone. There may be things that come along later that make us go back and, uh, and reevaluate. Here's another example. In, 19, or in 1944, the maximum permissible body burden for polonium-210 was two microcuries. 1947, primarily at the behest of uh, shoot, uh, Casey Morgan down at Oak Ridge, it was dropped to 0 0.2 microcuries. And then 1959, it was changed again with publication of NBS 59 to 0.04 microcuries. So see, over the years, our standards change as well. You know what this means? Well, now this was a huge deal because our bioassay program wasn't sensitive enough, enough in 1959 to see 0.04 microcuries. So we went to AEC at the time, requested uh, that we be able to keep the 0.2 microcuries uh, for a period of time until we're able to get to the 0.04, which they did, which we, we were eventually able to do. And then we went to, uh, we changed bioassay analysis, the radiochemical analysis portion so that we could get the uh, 0.04. And as it turns out, the person who proposed the process for getting from 0.2 microcuries to 0.04 microcuries by doubling the sample size and by plating on one side of the copper disc rather than both sides of the copper disc sits in this very room this very evening. Don't be warned. Yay. Our hero. Here's guy out the process right here. <laughs> Amazing. I knew, I knew we could use those guys. I'm so glad they're here. Okay, so interpreting the results. This is one of the, uh, um, this is uh, one, I have no idea which document this came out of. One of many that I read over the last month, five weeks. Routine monitoring to control polonium uptake was based solely on urine sampling. Uh, no intention to calculate dose. They were just reported in counts per minute per, uh, per 50 milliliters, and the chemical extraction method was based on the spontaneous deposition technique on the copper discs. Those calculations were used to determine a priority to the chronic excretion of 500, that's supposed to be DPM, 250 CPM in a 24-hour urine sample, or eight counts per minute in a 50 milliliter spot sample would be indicative of weekly exposures of 300 MR to the kidney and spleen. Okay, question. Sure. When you say 24 hours, you're going to mean you have to hold it for 24 hours. <laughs> yes. You have to carry that box around with you for 24 hours. And when you've got to go, you've got to go in the box. You have to hold it. You hold the box. You can hold the box. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't escape anywhere else. It's either in you or in the box. Notice that this, uh, that this, uh, when, when this report was written, the chronic excretion of 500 dpm, you notice that we have seen throughout this talk numbers of 3,000, 5,000, 500, and all kinds of different numbers for what corresponds to 300 mR in a, to the, in a week. Well, in this case, it's 300 mR to the kidney and spleen. I don't know what the other was kidney and spleen or whole body. But you see how it becomes very difficult to try to track what's exactly going on because the numbers change 
as the techniques change, as the, uh, as the models change, etc. Okay, so the bioassay, uh, or 51, the irradiant, irradiant radium program, 55, the sludge redrumming operation, ionium extraction project. Okay, here, these are alpha, and these are alpha uh, emitters, well, with, with the exception of the tritium program, of course. Here's the interesting thing about that. The easiest analysis to run is a gross alpha analysis. But you can't tell when you run a gross alpha whether it's thorium or uranium or plutonium. But if you know a person has only been working in a plutonium area, then you run a gross alpha on them, and that's going to give you probably the best results. But if they've been working in a mixture or in different areas, and you run a gross alpha, you don't know which the radionuclides are. So there were times in Mound's history that we would run gross alpha analyses if we knew a person was working only in the plutonium-238 process, the radiochemical analysis that we'd run on the person would be gross alpha. But if we knew they were working in, the uranium, in a uranium area and a plutonium area, we'd have to run a plutonium-specific analysis and a uranium-specific uh, analysis. Well, that's a lot more expensive, takes longer, and not, uh, and may in some cases not be as sensitive as the gross alpha analysis. Okay, in 1957, the October report shows number of samples analyzed for uh, protactinium, that's supposed to be ionium, plutonium, thorium-232, radium, and thorium. A lot of things that we were using around here um, uh, in 1957. Tritium year analysis was initiated by the end of the year to support new work. Statistics not included in the February 58 report. And those original tritium year analyses, the way they calculated tritium was to pour drops of urine slowly on calcium carbide, make tritiated acetylene, and that's what they counted. Kind of interesting. Um, you didn't want to smoke while you were doing that process, by the way. <laughs> Um, in 1968, the, um, they reported 24-hour samples uh, for gross alpha, blah, blah. They only used gross alpha. You know why? Because the only processes that they were using were, or the only uh, processes here at Mound were the polonium process, tritium process, and plutonium process. And the polonium workers and the plutonium workers weren't being mixed. So you could could run gross alpha on all of them. Cheaper, faster, uh, get a lot more uh, um, alpha out of your uh, out of your sample, so theoretically your uh, your uh, detection mode would be lower. I don't know whether that was really true or not. Or was it true that if you ran a gross alpha, you had a better detection limit than if you ran a specific radionuclide analysis? Well, <clears throat> that very, in other words, <clears throat> if you want to a fluoride precipitate uh, as opposed to the phosphate the final amount, you can reduce the natural background. And you, you can reduce the natural background by that uh, process and up the end. If you want to gross alpha, be sure it grows, you stay with the phosphate precipitate. And going to the fluoride reduce the background about so it was actually kind of a trade-off there. Yeah. Well, the detectors, uh, again, uh, at that time we were using two pi alpha counters. But uh, at the time, if you really wanted to get really finite, you, if you wanted electrodeposition. Yeah, and then... But I shunned electrodeposition until we had internal carriers. Yeah. Uh, electrodeposition was so problematic Unless you had an internal tracer, you don't know what you were Yeah, you don't know how much was plating out. Yeah. But, uh, the other thing, we, we didn't have to quite separate the people, like you say, because when we had work for this to tell us where they work. Yeah. And, and that's all part of that work control uh, process. And uh, work colonium, for a long time, the people who worked with colonium were not allowed to work with plutonium, vice versa, the maintenance people, I'm speaking. Right. And, uh, Finally, the 
was able to find out the way to clean up the, the samples for colonial to where we opened the gate and let them both go to places. So in the 1980s, the lower detection limits, um, plutonium was reduced from 0.1 picocurie per 24-hour sample to the 1991 LDL lower detection limit of 0 0.018. So we improved by about a factor of five in the 1980s. And a lot of that has to do with the type of equipment, and like Warren said, the different types of chemical processing that we used, etc. And the LDL in the 1980s for plutonium-239 was 0.08 picocuries in the 24-hour sample. And the routine analyses that they did this year, plutonium-238, 239, and tritium. And those are the only radionuclides uh, in 81, as I recollect. Okay, so here are some of the bioassay procedures. This is, came out of the Herb Myers report. It shows the different radionuclides, and along with that, and I know the, those of you in the back of the room can see very clearly, this is MD80030, and that's the procedure manual that that, that particular bioassay uh, was found in. So, Mount had, ver had good records of the procedures we used and when they were applicable and what we used them on. And that's very important if you're going to go back and do a dose reconstruction like uh, they're doing down at the EOICPA. What was that? Oh, we've already talked about that. Okay. So then in, uh, <coughs> I guess about 90, 1989, I guess, maybe 90, 10 CFR 835 came out, and they changed the monitoring requirements. This is where we needed to have uh, people monitored with dosimetry, either internal, external, or both. If the potential total effective dose equivalent, that's internal and external combined, was going to be 100 millirem in a year, then that person needed to be part of the uh, monitoring program. And there were special requirements for exposure to the embryo and special requirements for exposures to minors or visitors. So uh, that put a different slant on who was on, included in the bioassay program and who wasn't. Because uh, before 10 CFR 835, but after 1981, at some point in time, uh, due to budgetary cutbacks, we decided not to badge secretaries. I don't remember when that was. But then in 91, 90, after 10 CFR 835, we wound up badging a lot more people again after all. Okay, so another type of um, workplace indicator was air sampling. Now, as it turns out, 10 CFR 835 also allowed us to use air sampling as a way to assign doses based on what was in the air if there was what was called a technology shortfall. There were some radionuclides that we had around here, one of them being stable metal tritides. You know, stable metal tritides, what makes stable metal tritides stable is that when you, is that they don't, they're not very soluble. So if you inhale them, they don't come out in your urine, like if it's not a uh, stable metal tritide. So you couldn't really detect how much you had intaken by your analysis. So we used air sampling for stable metal tritides. We would count the filter, and based on that filter, assign a dose to the individual that worked in the, air, in the room or in the area where the uh, air sample was taken. Okay, uh, let's see. And, huh. Okay, so these are the different groups of people that were the different disciplines that were, have, were, have been and are involved in a dosimetry program. You got biologists, chemists, engineers, mathematicians, physicists, and of course you got to have management and quality in there as well to have a, uh, a well-formed program. Okay, here's an example of a change that was made at Mount, in Mound in 1948. The result of these experiments indicate that sulfamic acid is beneficial in keeping postum in solution. Anybody, anybody remember calling it postum? Yeah, that's polonium-210 back in the old days. George? 
uh, and should be used in amounts of 200 milligrams in this routine urine analysis in cartons. Um, and later it was incorporated into that uh, procedure. Uh, I think it was somewhere around 1946. People working in polonium areas are required to submit urine specimens at regularly scheduled intervals. An individual may be asked to submit samples weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or quarterly, depending on the frequency of contact with polonium, types of operations performed, and the amount of polonium handled in its normal work area. So this is kind of an idea of, of how the early, uh, early uh, internal dosimetry program is working. I thought I had some more, but maybe not. Okay, anybody got any questions on the mound dose? Oh, I know I've got another one there. Yeah, <laughs> this one. You see, this document just was published in 2008. Development of a biokinetic model for radionuclide contaminated wounds and procedures for their assessment of symmetry and treatment. There are changes in that compared to the way we did our work when we were here. You know what that means? Somebody somewhere is going to have to go back now and recalculate doses where people may have gotten uh, uh, wounds, contaminated wounds, because there may be different biokinetic models. You think they can sue them? Now that this has been published, now they, they have to go back and do, redo the biokinetic models. Then they're going to have to do the, uh, the algorithms and things of that nature. After that's all done, then they'll have to go back and look at the data and say, well, here's what the dose was to those people. So the dosimetry program as we know it, we may have answers, but they ain't the final answers. The book is still being written. Do you still have data for all the samples in place? Yes. As it turns out, okay. the group that's maintaining those data is uh, DOE Legacy Management. I think that's Stoller. <laughs> Stoller is maintaining them right now. Uh, and now, whether they're still using the mound more system or whether they've migrated that over to another system, that I don't know. At one time, they took the mound mesh system and more, and they had people trained to extract information from that system. And the data had all been uploaded into that. I say the data had all been loaded. I don't know whether the thorium data and the polonium data had gotten into that database or not. But the data does exist, legacy management has it, I hope. I'm assuming they did not send the records to Los Alamos, <laughs> which is a very touchy subject with me. Okay, let's see, I think I'll get this to say, any questions? Okay, any questions? You might explain what the mesh system was, the mesh report. Mesh system. MESH was Mound Environmental Safety and Health System. And it actually was, it started out as a small, a small database where we would integrate count room data, RWP, well, no RWPs weren't on it, but uh, count room data, um, bioassay data, and all would feed into MESH. Like any government operation, because it existed, it must expand or die. And so it did expand and it continued to expand. It wound up taking in RWPs, it wound up taking in um, a, or, um, I think by the time by the time Mound closed down there were like 27 modules that were in the mesh database system. It was a huge thing. It originally it started out on a small computer. Then it went to a VAX, blew through right, right through that VAX. Eventually it wound up on, it, they were going to put it on mainframe for a while, then they wound up putting it on, I think they wound up having a, a separate computer for it, and then they had to have a backup computer in case the primary went out. So it, it, got, it got to be a, it got to be a, it got to be a project that the government could have truly been proud of. <laughs> Who did? It started out, that's why your sanctions are so Mound high. folks <laughs> constructed the mesh modules. They constructed the first two or three mesh modules. Now it looks like, hey, we're going to have to do some big expansion here and get lots of money from Uncle Sugar. So before we did that, though, we were told, hey, wait a second. 
there are systems out there already that do the kinds of things you do it. Why don't we just buy one off the shelf? Looks like a good idea. We're going to have to start looking. Well, as it turns out, the systems that were out there were third generation. Mound Computer Group was already in the fourth generation types of software. They says, you know, we can go out and buy this, but the day we buy it, we're already going to be outdated and we're going to be updating it to get to, to uh, the fourth generation. And I think by the time we left here, we were at, what, sixth generation, something like that. So, um, so Mound decided to, to maintain the mesh system in-house. And so, now, Dave Hageman is a name that rings a bell. And I think Dave worked on the Hades system, if you remember that. Well, that was an appropriately named program. <laughs> <laughs> and that was that the Hades system started in 83. And I'll give you a name that you can go after the guy, Ron Daly. He was the guy that started the Hades system. And that was kind of the precursor. That was one of the first modules that fed into the mesh system. And the reason MESH was invented was to try to integrate workplace monitors or workplace monitoring programs with the people that were doing internal dosimetry. So that there was a formalized process so that Paul Melton didn't have to get on the bus over at, over at PP building, take the, take the trolley over to our building and give a piece of paper to somebody and then take another piece of paper to somebody else, another piece of paper to somebody else, and then come back up and then say, oh, I made a mistake, and then I have to go collect those up and take another piece of paper. That was what, the way our uh, workplace monitoring program was kind of working uh, up until the MESH system. Once MESH got in place, and I'll tell you what, what actually made MESH a workable system. Do you remember white mole and blue mole? And? Blue Molan is what made Mesh work. Because now, you could be sitting over in OS East and looking and seeing what the workplace indicators were in T-Building or SW or PP. 